Hi, Pastor Bob here. I'm here to talk to you about Operation Christmas Child. Last year was our first attempt at it. We had over 600 boxes come in, those shoe boxes, and it reached kids from all over the world. What is Operation Christmas Child? It is a box that puts a Christmas gift in there and some basic essential needs like toothbrush, comb, some shampoo, those things that some underprivileged uh, nations might not have. But the amazing thing is, it's distributed through the local church. And every one of these shoe boxes has the gospel message of Jesus Christ and the story of Christmas. Our goal this year is to reach as many kids across this world with the message of Jesus. If you'd like to learn more about uh, the shoebox ministry, come out to the information desk and we'll get you more of that information. God bless. Hey everybody, Tim Brown here. Just letting you guys know on the 26th of November, we will not have Kaleo service. Instead, we have other things happening around campus as well as around town that we'd encourage you guys to get involved in. On the 26th at five o'clock, you can show up at uh, Caney View Church in our fellowship hall and help us prep for our big Thanksgiving giveaway we do every Thanksgiving. What we do is we prep over a thousand meals and then on Thursday at 10 o'clock, we get them all out to the community and we encourage you guys to come then as well to help deliver those. Also, at the Avalon Theater, we're gonna be doing a night of worship called Give Thanks. And all the worship leaders in uh, the Vineyard Movement here in the uh, Grand Valley are all gonna be a part of that. And so we encourage you guys to come out. Uh, the doors open at six o'clock and then at seven o'clock, the worship night begins. Again, no Kaleo service on the 26th of November. Really hope you guys get involved around town. Thanks. Good morning. Happy Thanksgiving. You know, I, uh, I was just thinking about Thanksgiving this week, and um, it's appropriate to do a Thanksgiving message, right? But I know that uh, many uh, perceptions of Thanksgiving come when we come to this time of year, and I think that probably for those of us that work, the greatest blessing of Thanksgiving is getting the day off <laughs> and paid, right? Hopefully paid. <laughs> but I, I call it the F and F of Thanksgiving. You have food and football. <laughs> you have food and family. And you have food and more food. That's what Thanksgiving is like. And uh, for many, it's F and S, though. It's food and shopping. Oh, I still don't get that. I don't get that. But unfortunately, I, I also understand that Thanksgiving can be a time. It's the beginning of the holiday seasons. And for uh, many people, it's actually the darkest and most difficult time of the year for you because of losses you've experienced, because of uh, abandonment, because of rejection and brokenness. This just reminds you of what you don't have, especially when you see TV shows and hear songs of families reuniting and the joy and the love of being together, and you feel like you have nothing. And I understand that. And I hope that through today's message, it will give you a different sense of thanksgiving. It will give you a renewed sense of thanksgiving so that this thanksgiving possibly could be a time that you could reflect and have true thanks, thankfulness in your hearts. So with that, let's pray. Lord, you created us to be thankful people. And there's so many blessings and so many things that come when we practice the discipline of thankfulness. And so, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us today, that you would settle our hearts and help us to be focused on you instead of focused on ourself so that we can develop a, a truly thankful heart in a way that the focus is truly on you. So come, Holy Spirit, 
Let your presence come and speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we all know the history of Thanksgiving. For some of us, maybe we've forgotten. It's been a long time since we've been in grade school, right? We know that the Americans can, can trace back Thanksgiving to that group of pilgrims that landed on Plymouth Rock. Have you ever been to the Northeast and seen Plymouth Rock? It's about that big. <laughs> They're like, that's what is so exciting? But we know of that plantation of that group that landed in Plymouth, that they settled there, and that first harsh winter, half of that original group died. And there's the story of Squanto, a Patuxet, if I probably mispronounced it, Native American from the Wampanoag tribe, that he taught the pilgrims how to catch eel and to grow rice. Now, I did some deeper research. <laughs> and it wasn't corn, it was rice that he actually taught them. And he taught them this ancient delicacy called Yunagi Sushi. <laughs> and that's what helped them survive and thrive through that long, harsh winter. It's, it's in Wikipedia, look. <laughs> and we also know of the, the Wampanoag leader, his name was Massasoit, that also donated food and that they had stored for themselves that through his generosity helped them to make it through that long, harsh winter. And this, this is just a side thought. It, isn't it interesting how... God can implant something in a pagan-minded person to do something for the benefit of others. And it made me think of Romans 2, verse 14. Because as, as I read this, how many of you know people that you know aren't followers of Jesus, but are probably better Christians than you are? Any of you know people like that? I know numerous people that are more generous, more giving, more loving than a lot of Christians I know including myself. But it says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness. I think this guy, this chief, had the law of God written on his heart. And God used him to bring a generous spirit to help the people to survive. And then uh, there are many uh, people that say that other uh, people that came and they landed in places like Virginia, Florida, and Texas, that these people also had their own form of thanksgiving. I uh, also did some more research the pilgrims that landed in Texas, they immediately got on horses and they traveled to Colorado. And they're still doing that to this day. <laughs> and we give thanks for the Texans. Any Texans in here? God bless you. We love you. But there's this guy named Jeremy Banks, a historian. He said that Local boosters in Virginia, Florida, and Texas promote their own colonists who, like many people getting off a boat, gave thanks for setting foot again on dry land. So you can th think of the type of boats that they came across the Atlantic that um, months of travel, dependent on the winds blowing them in the right direction, of starvation, of scurvy, of, of all the things that these people suffered, you can imagine how when they finally landed on dry land, they were thankful. <laughs> and there is a charter of Berkeley 100 that their leader said, we ordain that the day of our ship's arrival at the place assigned for plantation in the land of Virginia, 
shall be literally and perpetually kept holy as a day of thanksgiving to Almighty God. So the point is, here's, here's what I think we need to hear this morning. For Thanksgiving to truly be a Thanksgiving for us, it comes when we realized what we've survived through. It comes when our lives have been preserved by the Lord God, God Almighty. And it comes when we realize that if God didn't show up, we wouldn't be here today. Amen. It's good for us to remember those kind of thoughts, isn't it? And so later, President Lincoln, in 1863, he designated Thanksgiving a national holiday. And that's what we get to uh, celebrate this coming Thursday. Now, I did have a revelation of sort this week as I was doing my devotions and uh, reading through the book of Nehemiah that I actually see that there was a Thanksgiving way before 1621 and that it actually came like around 400 B.C. So what we see here, here was that God had established this biblical principle of being thankful to the people of the nation of Israel. That as they traveled around in the wilderness, in the Sinai Peninsula for 40 years, as God took them out of captivity in Egypt and they finally landed in the promised land, God said, now be thankful. Celebrate this. And they, he gave them a principle of celebrating what is called the Feast of Booths. Feast of Booths. It's hard for me to say that. And so I think as we practice this discipline of being thankful, what we find is that there is strength that builds from within us when we become thankful people. Now, I'm going to jump ahead of what we're going to look at. I'm going to go to Nehemiah 8.10. And as I read this, I want you to read this with me out loud. That means at the same time. You speak with your voice out loud. Okay? Nehemiah 8.10. Read with me. Do not grieve. Lord, help me this morning. Okay, nudge your neighbor, say, speak with Kirk. Okay, Nehemiah 8.10, read with me. Is it up there? Okay. We're going to go to the end of 8.10. And it says, do not be grieved. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Let's say that again. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So where does strength come from? The joy of the Lord, of being thankful. And so practicing being thankful is so healthy for our spiritual wellness. And so are you going to be thankful this week? Okay, you're going to have a good week if you do that. Now, we're going to go to Nehemiah 7, verse 73. I'm going to read all the way through verse 8. Now, I just realized that I made a mistake that in my tablet I have the NIV and we have ESV up there. And so uh, I'm going to read from the screen. It says, So the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers... Some of the people, the temple servants in all Israel, lived in their towns. And when the seventh month had come, the people of Israel were in their towns. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it 
facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. In the presence of the man and the woman and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, all those guys. <laughs> Go to the next one. <laughs> and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and as he opened it, all the people stood. I think Ezra was short too. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And, and those guys. <laughs> Help the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. Now, there's some great principles that we can learn from this account. First of all, we need to understand that thanksgiving first comes from the word of God. That, that is our plumb line. That is what builds the foundation in our lives. And so what we're seeing here is if we would catch up historically what was going on with the people was they were in captivity in Babylon, their, their people, for over 100 years. And by a miracle of God, God uses Nehemiah to approach the king of Persia. His name is Artaxerxes. What a name. I guess when you're head of something, you can be named anything. And so God releases them, gives them favor, and allows them to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem because they were in shambles, they were in ruins, and the people were susceptible to the attacks of the enemies. And so they completed the task. They had rebuilt the walls after many years, and they were coming together as a people to celebrate what God had done. And so the first thing they do when they gather together is they open up the law. Now the law, this is called the Torah or the Pentateuch. These are the first five books of the Old Testament. This would be Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. This is the law that was prescribed to the people through God to Moses. And Moses uh, uh, recorded this for the people. So what we need to see from this account is their high regard for God's word. The unbelievable reverence and, and awe and respect to God's word because they understood that this was God who spoke through Moses the prophet to them. They were hearing the words of God. And so they stood in awe and reverence and they did it from morning to midday. You know how long that is? Six hours. Six in the morning till 12. Now, many of you, when an hour is up here, you're ready to go, right? But, but there is something to this of their respect and their all is a model for how we should have that high regard for God's word, that God speaks to us through his word. Now, it's interesting what historians... Historic, Historians, <laughs> historians, I need more water. I knew that sounded wrong. What they believed was that the people, if you can imagine being in captivity in Persia for over 100 years, that through about uh, two and a half generations, they've lost their original language of Hebrew. And so most of the people spoke in Aramaic. And so as the scriptures was being read in Hebrew, the scribes, those guys, were walking among the people and interpreting to them and helping them to understand what was being read. 
And so I think this gives us a picture of what we're trying to begin to promote in the church is this whole movement of discipleship. Is that we need somebody that's walked around the block a few more times than us that we can meet with individually and they can say, okay, let's look at the word of God together and let's help you to understand what it's saying. And then you have someone that walks with us in our journey of life. And the big clue for us that we see here, that what's in their hearts, I'm going to read from the NIV. In verse 5, it says, and All the people could see him because he was standing above them. As he opened it, the people all stood up. And Ezra praised the Lord, the great God. All the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen. Amen. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And so the second thing of thanksgiving is after reading the word of God and as God speaks to us, we worship. And what worship is, it's having a focus to an audience of one. Focus is lifting our eyes up and looking at God. And as they lifted their hands and they shouted together in unison, amen and amen. It's like they were saying it with an explanation point, God has spoken. God has spoken to us. And they got on their knees and they bowed with their faces to the ground. Now, for, for most of us in a Western culture, we have kind of lost sense of that kind of respect and awe, haven't we? When in, in this culture, when you bow with your faces to the ground, you're bowing to a person of royalty. You're bowing to a person that has high esteem and regard in your life. And as you bow with your face down to them, it is a picture of the utmost respect and honor and tribute to that person. I remember when I was a young boy, a young boy, I was taken by my mom to our local judo gojo, or judo school in Denver. And uh, the first thing they taught us was how to bow down on our knees at the mat and how to bow before the sensei. It's not like we were worshiping him, like he was a god. No, it wasn't that. But it was paying our respects to our teacher that knew more than we did. Right? Th this sense of worship, what it is, it is acknowledging in our hearts, and I think having a physical expression of that is that we are willing to block out all the world, we're willing to block out what others think of us, we're willing to, in a sense, be unashamedly worshipful in giving honor and respect to God and God alone. See, that's, that's what we're trying to teach us here at Canyonview with these amazing guys. This form of worship, of, of singing and worship, is we're not just singing cool songs, but we're helping us to have an attitude of worship and lifting up our hearts, our minds, and our bodies to God because He deserves it. Does that make sense? So worship comes from thanksgiving of what God has done in our lives. Now, in Nehemiah 8, verse 9, I'm going to read from the screen again. Let's go to the screen. It says, And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready, for this day is holy to our God, to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Let's all read that again. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet. 
for this day is holy, do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. So what we see here is thanksgiving opens our hearts to God's redeeming love. Let me explain this from what I see here. As they were reading the law, they had great reverence and respect for God's law. Why were they responding in weeping and mourning? Because they knew that the reason they were taken into captivity was because of their rebellion against God and their worshiping of idols. And so God used them going into captivity as a form of, wake up, I'm serious when I say you shall worship me and no other gods. And it, it leads us to what Paul, the Apostle Paul, was talking about in Romans 3, verse 19. It says, I better read from that. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So what was happening here? They were reading through the whole law in those six hours. The response of the people was, oh my gosh, we are busted. And they began to weep and mourn before a holy God. I think that's a natural, appropriate response when we understand that the law is there to reveal what's going on in here. And so if, if I can kind of put this in a synopsis real quickly of what was happening here. Now, obviously, this is very simplified for time's sake. God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And God created man and woman to have relationship with him, an re intimate relationship of love. But they rebelled against God and wanted to become like him, and they wanted to be in control of their own fates apart from God. That's when sin entered the world and caused the separation from God and the penalty of that is death. And then death and destruction entered into the world and entered into all of creation. So what does God do? He immediately, he immediately promises a savior. He promises to redeem man back to him. He gives mankind a second chance. Then he creates a special people group, and he promises that through them, he would preserve them as a people group because through their seed would come the Messiah or the Savior, Jesus Christ. But the Jews continually rebelled against God, and they forgot all that God had done for them. So they go into captivity because of the hardness of their sins, because of the hardness of their hearts, but God heard their cries. And through Nehemiah, and by his grace and mercy, he allows them to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls. So that's where we come to this time where the people are saying, in a sense, oh my gosh, we've been a hard-headed people. We have, we have dissed God over and over again. And we don't deserve God's goodness. We don't deserve, what we really deserve is his wrath and his judgment. And they were saying, God, we're sorry for what we've done. We don't deserve what we've done. And we deserve your punishment, but you still give us what we don't deserve. And that's grace. And that's mercy. You see, that's what's happening here. And so if we go back to verse 10, again, of Nehemiah. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions 
to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our God. Read this again with me out loud. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So where did their joy come from? It came from acknowledging God's grace. It came from acknowledging God's provisions for them. It came from acknowledging God's power and sovereignty in releasing them from a pagan king so they could go back and rebuild their walls and start over again as a new nation. You see, God didn't give them what they deserved. He gave them what came out of his heart his redeeming heart. That is the story of Nehemiah, and that is the story of each of our lives, and that's what thanksgiving should come from. Realizing that none of us, myself included, have got what we deserve from God. What we got and what we have and will have for all time is God's love, his mercy, and his grace. That, my friends, is worth being thankful for. Amen. So thanksgiving is truly a time to respond to our salvation. So what happened here was after this, the people made a declaration and they went out and they all celebrated this festival, festival of booths. <laughs> It's called the Feast of Tabernacles, where they make these little like tent-like things, and they lived out there for seven days to remind them of how God preserved them as a people as they wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years and brought them to the Promised Land, and now brought them back so that they can celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles again. This was a great celebration for them. It was, in, it was their response to how God preserved their lives individually and as a nation. And it's very possible that the Lord is speaking to someone in this room today individually. Maybe you've been in your own sort of captivity. Maybe you have, in a way, walked away from God and You've been trying to steer the course of your own life without God in the story. And it's very possible that the Lord is saying, I want you to let go of the will and let me become the Lord of your life. Maybe you're realizing that through all the years and all the things you've been through, God has preserved your life. And he's preserved your life in order for you to know him. And he's calling you to know him today. He's saying to you, do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the joy comes when we receive salvation through his grace. I just invite you to maybe today say yes to Jesus and invite him into your life. And just say simply, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Lord, that I've been trying to control my life and I left you out of it. That is the easiest and simplest definition of sin. You see, the joy comes in knowing that God did what he did through Jesus Christ to make it possible that through what Christ suffered on the cross, we have salvation we have life in him ephesians 1 7 what it says is in him we have redemption through his blood jesus's blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight so when we understand this, when we understand how, God, how good and gracious God has been to us, what should flow out of this is having hearts of generosity. Because thanksgiving leads to generosity. You go back to verse 10 again. It says, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. 
for this day is holy to our Lord. Right here. And you, you look at the scriptures, you look at the law. God always makes account to make sure that we have provisions to serve the poor. We go to Leviticus 19, verse 9. It says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. You see, that's from the law. What he's, what he's saying here is always make provisions so that the poor can be taken care of. And that really is the heart of the Father. And it's one of the things I love about this church is you guys care for the poor. Every time we have something that we're going to reach out to the poor, you guys step up. And I love that. And I think this Thanksgiving food ministry outreach that we're doing this Thursday is, to me, one of the favorite things we do as a church. It really is. And Pastor Bob told me that right now we have requests for 800 mils, and probably by Thursday we're going to go over 1,000. And so Bob said we still need some stuffing, we need mashed potatoes, and we still need a few turkeys. So if any of you would like to prepare one of those three and bring it to the church on Wednesday to, so that we can use it for our outreach, um, please go and sign up at the information desk after this. And we will be delivering to over 350 locations of homes and facilities. And so if, if you want to be blessed, sign up to deliver one of these meals. And Thursday morning, uh, this, I love just being there and seeing the faces of families that come together to get the meal, and they're all leaving together to go deliver it. Uh, it is something that is, uh, it, it just warms my heart to see how people are saying, we are going to give this food to someone in need. And they're all stoked about it. And that really, you know why? I think it's because it's something that God places in our hearts. And to really be thankful and have a real thanksgiving, I think God says, do something that you're being generous. Maybe find someone that doesn't have family here and invite them to your home with your family for thanksgiving. Let, let's outdo each other. And, and maybe someone who doesn't have family here gets asked by 10 families in this church. So I'm going to invite up the worship team here. So there's three things that I want to leave you with that I want you to practice this week through uh, from today until Thursday. And I think these, if you practice these three things, this Thanksgiving is going to be truly a, a true Thanksgiving that isn't dependent on what's going on in the world around you and in your life externally. This is something that will build Thanksgiving in here with us. The first thing is that you would focus some concentrated time this week in being in the Word of God. Dust off your Bibles, open that baby up, go to the book of Nehemiah. Read through the whole book of Nehemiah this week. Read through it a couple times if you'd like. And I want you to focus on what God did to bring the people back, the obstacles that they overcame through Nehemiah's unbelievable leadership and what brought them to this place where they're giving thanks and praise to God and worshiping him. The second thing that I would do is take some time this week that you would yourself personally worship God. Put on your headsets, put, open up uh, a worship CD from your iPad or your, your, your cell phone and just spend time just worshiping God and lift up your praises to Him. Now, you're, you're going to be private in your, your own room or, or close your office door. Try this while you're worshiping. Get on your knees and get on your face before God and worship Him. 
Now, you don't need to worry about some people thinking you're weird because nobody's there but God. Can you do that? Try it and see what God does in your heart. And the third thing is start giving thanks to God. I would encourage you guys to start journaling. I did this. Jane and I got away for a couple of days. We went up to a cabin up on Glade Park for a couple of days. And uh, in the morning, we, we spent time in the, in the Word and, and praying. And uh, what I did was on my journal, I just started journaling all the things that came to my mind that I was thankful for. And I'm going to keep doing that this week. Uh, just journal that and make a log. And some of us, you've got to start small. Because in your heart, you're not thinking, I don't have that much to be thankful for. But maybe you can be thankful that you have breath right now. Maybe you can be thankful that you have more hair than other guys your age. Nope. Nope. (laughs) But start doing that. And I want to actually, when Bob preached, when I was deserted by my airlines a couple weeks ago. There, there's, uh, there's some things I want to read here. Of These are some of the thankfulness, the thankful things that people wrote out and brought up front from a couple weeks ago. These, these were some of the highlights for me. It says, thank you, Lord, for giving me hope, courage, patience, and most of all, peace in the trials I have had. Thank you for keeping my family safe. My prayers are answered at your timing, but they are being answered. I praise you, God, for coming into my life and showing me your presence. Then this one. Thank you, Lord, for keeping my husband from death in 1995 so that he would become a Christian in 2001. (laughs) Thank you, Lord, for our separation and reconciliation in 2001. Thank you, Lord, for my life back by taking away my desire for pot. Thank you for my desire for you. Isn't that awesome? Here's one. Praise God, the only one who could change my heart and give me understanding that when my dad passed away, leaving five kids and my mom, that we wouldn't mourn like those who had no hope, but rejoice that our dad is in heaven with Jesus. Praises for everything we are. I really would have nothing without him. Now that's a godly attitude right there. And this last one. You gave me value, Lord, when others didn't. Others put me in the trash, and every time you pulled me out dusted me off and moved me along. I was a child and teenager and didn't fully understand and know you, but you kept the worst case scenarios from happening. When others put me in the trash, you did not let me remain there. I love you, Lord. See, those are examples of being thankful. Take some time this week and acknowledge what you have to be thankful for. And the last thing is practice generosity this week. Look for ways that you can be generous. You'll be surprised how a little act of generosity will put great thankfulness in your own hearts. And take your focus off of what you have to feel sorry for and begin to be thankful in giving to others. So let's stand. Let's practice this that we talked about. As we worship God, let's be thankful and worship Him for who He is, for what He's done in our lives, and what He's going to do. Amen? Amen. Let's worship.